Please arise in spirit and or body for the call to worship. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, come worship a God who feeds the hungry. In the midst of a world where people are abused and oppressed, come worship a God who calls for compassion and justice. In the midst of a world filled with wars and rumor of war, come worship a God who desires nothing less than peace for the world. In the midst of a world of spiritual emptiness, come worship a God who gives life meaning. Come worship a God whose grace and love knows no end. be seated. Will you join with me in prayer? God, you have given all peoples a common origin, and it is your will that we should be gathered together as one family in yourself. Fill the hearts of humankind with the fire of your love and with the desire to ensure justice for all. By sharing the good things you give us, may we secure an equality for all, our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Give us joy and hope, and may there be an end to division, strife, and war. May there be a dawning of a true human society built on love and peace. We ask this in your name. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to worship at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. We're glad that you've joined us either online or here in the sanctuary. We're glad that you came out on this cold morning. We are here because we want to walk together and we come together and look for that peace that Christ gives us that passes all understanding. And so as we search for that peace in our lives, we open ourselves up in worship to receive the peace of Christ. And we confess our sins, not so that we can grovel before God, but so that we can empty all that shame and guilt and stuff we carry around us that gets heavy. And we can give it to God and be liberated and freed for joyful life together. This morning we're going to pray a prayer of confession that comes from our brothers and sisters and siblings in the Congo. We have many ministry partnerships there in the United Methodist Church. So join with me now in the prayer of confession as we pray together with our brothers and sisters and siblings in the Congo. Merciful and mighty God, we thank you for allowing us to come before you with honesty and humility. Please forgive us when our actions lead to the oppression of others. Please forgive us when we ignore the pains and the joys of our neighbors near and far. When we feel like we can make no difference in the face of injustice and suffering, please redeem us and set us free with the good news that you are a God through whom all things are possible. When despair threatens to overwhelm, please fill us with your spirit of hope and lead us forth with your saving love, which knows no bounds. As we have shared the secrets of our hearts with God, we can be assured that God is faithful and slow to anger and quick to forgive. God hears our confessions and hears our hearts and forgives our sins and gives each one of us a new beginning. May we live in the assurance that we are God's forgiven people and empowered to break our deafening silence, speaking justice and defending those who are helpless and have new hope. Hear the good news. We are forgiven in Jesus' name. And all God's people say together, thanks be to God. I would like to invite you as you're able to stand. In a moment, we're going to share the peace of Christ. And uh, kids, I want to invite you as we're sharing the peace of Christ to head up to the front pew to, for, to prepare for Keisha's time with children. So the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Share the peace of Christ with each other. Good morning, everyone. And to those of you joining us online, we're so glad that you are with us. Children, how are we doing after the holiday season and you're back in school? Give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or an in-between. Let's see. Honest answers. Okay, we've got a good mix. We have a lot of, like, in-between. We've got an enthusiastic th two thumbs up from Juniper. Some of us are struggling. Well... No matter how you're feeling, I'm so happy that you're here and that you came no matter where you are on the scale. Okay, for the rest of you after the holiday season, 
Where are you feeling in the midst of things? Give us a, give us a scale, up, middle, down. Okay, notice, notice how your neighbors are feeling and connect afterwards. Ask them a question. Why is it this? Why is it this? Why is it this? Um, and let's encourage each other. This, this is an exciting time of year, but it can also be a time of year where we all just kind of tank. Um, after the holiday season, we've had too much sugar. It's very cold outside. There's a lot going on. And Juniper says, I'm tired. Oh, that was Anora. Anora says, I'm tired. You're tired. You told me you watched four hours of YouTube this morning. <laughs> that would make anybody tired. Well, nice. She was doing puzzles this morning. That's, that's fantastic. So this morning, I, would, I just want to talk for just a couple minutes about the difference between fitting in and belonging. So I asked everybody this morning where, where you were at, and I asked for honest answers. And I hope that nobody gave a thumbs up just because they wanted to fit in. I hope everybody was able to be honest in their answer. So kids, I want you to think for just a second. If you're trying to fit in, what does that mean? Does, does anybody, can anyone give me a quick answer? Anora, what does it mean if you're, gonna, if you're trying to fit in with people? Yeah, she says it's when you're like trying to be the same. So if someone is different than you, there's a group and they all have something that's the same, but it's different than you, does that mean you have to change something about yourself in order to fit in? So we're getting no's and yeses. And, and we're gonna talk about both of these answers. So if you have to change something about yourself in order to fit in with a group, that, that doesn't feel good. But that's what fitting in is. It's when we change something about who we are so that we can be a part of a group. But that doesn't mean that we belong because that means we're not living as our authentic self. Yes or no? Yes. So for the ones who answered no, if, if, we, if we can join a group and we don't have to change who we are, that means we belong. So it doesn't mean we fit in, it means we belong. And kids, I want us to think in our Sunday school program here at Hennepin and all the stuff that we do together as kids, when we have someone in our group who might be a little different in one area or another, I wanna make sure that we are not asking them to change who they are to fit in with our group, but instead saying, hey, I really like who you are, you belong here, join us. We like how you're different, and that makes our group stronger or better. And for the rest of us at Hennepin, I think we should consider that, that same concept. Are we asking people from the outside who visit Hennepin or who are looking to join Hennepin, are we wanting them to fit into our culture here at Hennepin? Or are we just saying, hey, you, you belong here, you have a place here, no matter who you are. We're not asking you to change something about who you are in order to belong here. So let's consider that as we see new faces and we, and we greet new people. And even with those that we already know, everyone in this room, you didn't have to give the thumbs up to, to fit in here today. You just had to come with wherever you're feeling this post-holiday season um, and know that you belong here no matter how you're feeling today. All right, we're gonna pray and then kids are gonna head with me and our Sunday school um, uh, teachers to the chapel. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, loving and accepting all of us for exactly who we are. Thank you for creating us to be exactly who we are. Thank you that we belong to ourselves. Thank you that we belong to you. And that thank you that in you and through Christ, we can belong to one another. And I pray that you would help us not to try and fit in but to try and, and truly belong. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, you can join me. We'll head to the chapel.
The scripture this morning is from the book of Numbers, chapter 27, the first 11 verses. Then the daughters of Zelophehad came forward. Zelophehad was son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, of the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of his daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Terza. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the congregation of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the congregation of Korah, but died for his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan because he had no son? Give to us a possession among our father's brothers. Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their father on to them. You shall also speak to the Israelites, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall pass his inheritance on to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall possess it. It shall be for the Israelites a statute and ordinance as the Lord commanded Moses. The word of God for the people of God. Some of you may know that I have five siblings, and there is about an 18-year age gap between oldest to youngest. So when my younger sister was born, my older brother was about to head off to college. So God bless my parents. Uh, when they were parenting teens and preteens, they were also managing a baby and a toddler, depending on the, the season. Uh, and I don't know if my parents ever reflected on what was the hardest season of parenting for them, but I think if I were to guess, the hardest season of parenting for them amongst raising six kids would probably have to be when my two younger brothers and I were teenagers. Yeah, we were all like really close in age, and so three kids hitting teenage years was pretty rough. <laughs> And uh, because there were six of us, uh, my parents were outnumbered. Uh, some parents can do the, you know, man-to-man -man defense. My parents didn't ever have that luxury after I was born. They always had to do the zone defense and hope that the kids didn't scatter into opposite corners and just totally disorient them. And my poor sister, who is the baby of the family, who is the youngest and just out by her lonesome, truly the baby, uh, because there's about an eight-year age gap between, or six years age gap between her and the old, next oldest. And that meant that she was left vulnerable to the whims of the next three older, older kids, myself and my two younger brothers. And, you know, we kind of ganged up on her because she was the baby. And because we were teenagers at that point, we were pretty self-focused, and uh, when we wanted to watch a movie, we picked out a movie that we wanted to watch. And because we were, because uh, my parents were very careful about the content that we watched, we knew that the movie that we, movies we'd pick out were not appropriate for my sister. And so what do you do when you can't watch the movie? Oh, we decided to send my little sister upstairs to my parents' room to watch Winnie the Pooh on the tiny little VHS player that my mom and dad had in their room. And, you know, my sister, being the peacemaker and peacekeeper that she is, uh, she suffered in silence as uh, she was banished to this room while the, her older three siblings were eating popcorn, and all together in the nice living room. And it was unfair, and, you know, she didn't say that at the time, but a couple years later, we kind of reflected, and she shared how that made her feel, and it didn't feel very good. 
And it never occurred to us, unfortunately, that we could just watch Winnie the Pooh with her and watch an age-appropriate movie with her. No, we wanted to watch the movie that we wanted to watch. And, you know, because we were focused on ourselves, we didn't really understand that there was some hurt being experienced on her part. It was pretty clear for her, the one that was the odd person out, the youngest, the baby, um, but for our, my, sibling, my two siblings and I, we just, it didn't really occur to us because we were getting what we needed. And, you know, I wonder if maybe the daughters of Zalofiad felt a little like my sister, on the losing end of a law or rule that was not set up to be fair to all of the people, especially not to women. Because this passage takes place after the Hebrew people escaped Egypt, and now they were on the tail end of wandering in, throughout the wilderness, and they were so close to entering the Promised Land. The generation that exited Egypt uh, had all died off, and as was foretold by God, and so now the second generation, the generation that was going to realize the hope of the Promised Land, were so close. And so as the census was being read about who was going to inherit the land, the daughters of Zalophihad realized that they weren't going to inherit any land. And this was due to the fact that the land to be inherited was, was going to be given out to the men that could, could go to war, because to enter the promised land meant that they had to go conquer some people, and the people that were conquered, the land that they conquered, was going to be divided up by the men who went to war and risked their lives. And it was un unfair, and I think it would probably felt logical to the people making the laws, but for these five sisters, they, sought, they saw the future. They saw that they were about to be in a spot where they were going to have no land. And on top of that, they, because this, having land was part of being part of a covenant community. So not only they were they going to be vulnerable to not having a means of survival, they also were going to be functionally ex exiled from their community. Their only hope really was to hope that some other male of head of household would take them in and then they would take on that household name, thus losing their, the name of their father. The text doesn't say what took place between, between the law being read and what comes next, but I'm sure there's some conversations that happened between the sisters. What does this mean? This feels unfair. What do we do? They had no rights as women, and they had no power or authority, but they decided nonetheless to take action. They wanted their voice to be heard. So they stood outside the tent of meeting to speak to Moses. The tent of meeting was literally where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, the holiest of holies, only the most powerful and privileged of the men in the community were allowed to be in there. So they stood just outside to talk to Moses and the high priests. And they demanded their inheritance. They lost their father, and now they were faced with losing their place in their community. It was risky to bring forth this demand, but they stood to lose it all if they didn't get Moses to reconsider. And what happens next could have gone differently. Moses could have gotten really defensive and offered these, and offended, and chastised these women for questioning his authority. He could have silenced them by appealing to the rigidity of this law. This is the law, There's, this can't be changed. Or saying this is how things have always been. He could have easily dismissed them, and there would be, have been little to no pushback from other leaders. They were women, after all. They were really actually supposed to be talking to them because the men were the ones who counted in this community. But instead, Moses listened. And after listening and considering, he decided to take to God to, for guidance. And surprisingly, God responds not only that the women were right, he actually vind vindicates them and says, we need to make this right. He offers a corrective action, and 
it, it was a corrective action that would mean that they could inherit land. He, Moses didn't come back with a piffy answer that we heard your concerns, we gave it some thought, we gave it, we prayed about it, and we're still going to go forward with it. Nope, they, God heard the cries of these women and decided that this law that quite literally uh, for the Ten Commandments was written into stone literally changed it because this law no longer served the community and God made way for change. So when they brought these cakes before the leaders, they, their voice may have trembled a little bit. I'm sure they wondered if they would be taken seriously. But they acted with courage and believed that they served and followed a God that made way for better ways of living in community, that there was hope for a better future, that the future and the reality that was there in the, to in the moment was not the end goal. This was not the end of the story. There was a possibility for, for a new and better way of thriving as community. But when we fall into cynicism and hopelessness, we can think that what the current reality is all that there ever will be. We tell ourselves this is how it always will be. Maybe it's just better to be resigned to our fate and figure out how to cope. We begin to lose our ability to dream of a better world. Resentment seeks, seeps in because when we, see, when we fall into cynicism, believing that things, this is how it always will be, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because we didn't ever ask if there was a better way. We didn't ask, ever ask if there was a new way of living as a community. We just said, this is all, this is as good as it's going to get. And being an underdog in the world of disadvantages is indeed hard. I mean, I can really empathize with these daughters. But when we lose hope, we lose the ability to address brokenness. We believe that war is just a fact of life. We just accept that the poor will always be among us. We just resign ourselves that our political system will always look like a kangaroo court set to benefit the wealthy. We just resign ourselves to believing that the corrupt will never be held accountable. Why do any good deeds when it's not going to make any difference in the end? Why even bother? And when we become more insulated and hopeless, we begin to become more isolated from our community. Because when it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, it's every person for themselves. We gotta look out for ourselves first and foremost. And so the goal becomes shielding yourself and your loved ones from all the perils of the world. And who cares about the un other injustices, injustices and unfairness in the world? That's someone else's problem. I'm looking out for mine and my family. It doesn't matter if there's suffer other people are suffering because truthfully, my family's not suffering. When you are trying to stay above water and trying to survive, it's really hard to muster up extra energy to help others. Perceived or real, when our brains tell us that we are in danger, we act accordingly. And this is one lesson from this passage this morning. When presented with a demand, Moses did not respond right away. He heard that there was harm being done. He took the time to reflect and then brought the request before God. And when we are presented with a problem, it's our job to first to listen, to reflect, and then to go to God and seek guidance and be open to the Holy Spirit to lead us to respond. And when we have fully understood the problem and have gone to God and sought, sought guidance, we don't just stop at acknowledging the, the harm. That's, that's unfortunate, and that's the way that systems be perpetuate themselves. We need to go the step further to actually take action to fix the problem. 
And that's the step in the process that we most struggle with. Because we hear all the time about a problem or injustice, our news is filled with short tidbits of harm being done, someone harming another person, and the outrage ensues, the person is held accountable, so to speak, and we feel good about responding to the injustice. But when we actually have to put some thought into addressing the harm, why is it that we are, tre are treating each other so poorly? Why, is, why, are we having ex why are people having explosions and harming people over small things? Oftentimes the problem feels too big, the solution's not clear, and we don't feel equipped to actually take action. So we do our ver version of posting on social media thoughts and prayers and feel slightly absolved of the need to take action because we care. And sometimes we get overwhelmed with the thought about uh, wondering how and thinking that we alone are uh, responsible for fixing the world's problems. But the good news is that God is already at work in the world. You don't need to worry about fixing the world's problems on your own. You don't have to draft the plan, forecast the obstacles, and assess the risks. The obstacles are numerous and the risk is astronomical. But when we are tune, attuned to the leading of the Spirit, the way forward becomes a little bit more in focus. The solution's not clearly laid out, but when you're not responsible for having all the answers, it's a little bit easier to take a small action. And when you're not alone in addressing the problem, but doing it alongside a community, it becomes easier still because you're not on the front lines alone doing the, injust doing the justice work. And we know even still when we are in community, going before and speaking truth to power still takes courage. It took courage for these daughters to go before Moses, but they were doing it together. They were one collective voice going together and being in solidarity with one another, and they weren't just advocating for their own benefit, they were advocating for their four other sisters and other unnamed women that this law would impact. So when we see ourselves as in more interconnected, our capacity and our tolerance for injustice and unfairness goes down. Because when we see ourselves as connected, when someone else is, is suffering harm, the harm is to us too. Because our joys, our pain, our suffering, and our triumphs are all, are all shared in community. And so to ignore the plight of five, of five young women is to ignore the plight of your own thriving. But there's a lot of work to be done when we address pain and suffering in our community. And everyone has a part to play in it, young and old. And before we ask ourselves what impact we could have in our community, let's consider the example of Mari Kopenny. In 2014, the drinking water in Flint, Michigan was contaminated with lead because during a budget crisis, the leaders of the town decided to draw the drinking water from the Flint River. This decision exposed over 100,000 residents to elevated lead levels. And unfortunately, because for all the reasons, the socioeconomics, the race, just all the, all the political reasons, once it was realized what had been done and all these people were ingesting lead, the crisis was not really taken seriously. And all, people of all ages were being exposed to the lead and the solutions that were coming up were just stop gaps and the damage was still being done. So Mari, who was age eight at the time, was very concerned about this crisis because it was impacting her, but it was also impacting her parents, her school, her school teachers, her, her, student, her friends, her family, and so she decided to take action. She wrote a letter to President Barack Obama, and it, I want to read it for you. It reads as follows. Mr. President, 
Hello, my name is Mari. I'm eight years old. I live in Flint, Michigan, and I'm more commonly known around town as Little Miss Flint. I'm one of the children that is in infected by this water, and I've been doing my best to march in protest and to speak out for all the kids that live here in Flint. This Thursday, I'll be riding a bus to Washington, D.C. to see the congressional hearings of our Governor Rick S Snyder. I know this is probably an odd request, but I would love for a chance to meet with you or your wife. My mom says chances are that you will be too busy with more important things, but there's a lot of people coming on these buses, and even just meeting a meeting from you or your wife would really lift our spirits. Thank you for all you do for our community. I look forward to being able to come to Washington to be able to see Governor Snyder in person and to be able to be in the city where you live. Thank you, Mari. And President Obama received this letter, and he sent a letter back that said he would be traveling to Flint, Michigan next week. He wanted to see the crisis himself, and he, during that visit, he met Mari. And I encourage you to look up the photo of the, when they met, their embraces, their, they hugged each other, and it was just a powerful moment. But during that time, he thanked her for her advocacy, and what resulted from this letter of adv from Mari, an eight-year-old, was increased nationwide awareness of the crisis, and Obama would eventually authorize $100 million to fix the crisis. And Mari continues to advocate for her beloved city to this day. This young woman saw the need, acted according to her abilities, and she shot for the stars. She saw an injustice, and she wrote a letter not just to her local politician, but she believed that the President of the United States, the most powerful man, one of the most powerful persons in the world, might pay attention if he only knew what was going on in this, in this town in Michigan. So the invitation today for each one of you to consider is how might you be courageous in the face of injustice? How can each one of us respond to injustice, not just with thoughts and prayers, but with action? And may we take action, even if our voice trembles, even if we wonder if we're gonna be silenced or ignored, even if we're not gonna get the results that we know, we think we'll get hoping and believing and knowing that the Holy Spirit will soften the hearts of those in power. And as we grow individually and collectively, let our actions be in line with our words. Words are cheap. They're easy to say. And when you're unsure if you have what it takes to right injustices, just think of the examples of these five daughters. Remember the courage of an eight-year-old that believed that it was just unacceptable that water, drinking, safe drinking water was not available to her residents. So I wonder how each one of us might, in small ways, speak to the unfairness in our midst. Be that voice that says, this is unfair. Did you realize that this is causing harm? And may, when we are questioning ourselves, may we remember that even the people that we count out, the underdogs, even they are used by God. So with all the, all the, all the privileges and all the things that we have, the skills and the gifts, what might we all accomplish together? Amen. This morning as we come to God in prayer, we have a lot of things to think about. Thank you, Laura. Lots of things to think about, ways that we can really stand with the underdog. Maybe some of you feel like underdogs this morning. There are prayers uh, requests listed in your bulletin, and I noticed this morning there are a lot of them. So please um, take that bulletin home with you and pray for those folks who have asked for your prayers. And I've been thinking a lot about what you've been saying, Laura. Um, we are having, we have a new executive director starting for the Dignity Center. We had wonderful candidates that applied for that position. And we had several, several really strong candidates. But the search committee decided to hire Reverend Margaret Mary Kelly. 
She is at ELCA, a Lutheran pastor who has a passion for social justice and has, also has a master's in social work. And so I'm going to ask you this morning in a time of silence before we pray our prayer that is going to be up on the screen in a moment to pray for, Mary Mar for Margaret Mary and for our Dignity Center. And I want you to know that our Dignity Center has been over in the ministry house and we've been a part of that ministry. We have initiated and started that ministry over 20 years ago. It is still going very strong and it needs your prayers, but it also needs your voice and your volunteering. So I'm gonna ask that you pray about that this morning. And if you're interested in getting more involved in our Dignity Center, um, talk to me after worship or you can send an email to Kevin at haonc.org. He is our interim director, and he will be in that position until um, Margaret Mary starts on the 17th of January. So pray about that, because that is a place where we are standing with those who are underdogs in our community. And um, that is something concrete and specific that you can do to be part of God's work in this area. Let's take a moment of silence to pray and search our own hearts about how God might be using us uh, to do justice in the world. And then let us join together in prayer in a responsive prayer that will be on the screen. Let us pray for the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let us pray for those who are hungry now, for they will be filled. Let us pray for those who weep, for they will laugh. Let us pray for the despised and excluded, for in that day they shall leap for joy, for surely their reward is great in heaven. Loving God, we lift up all those who have asked for prayer this morning, and we pray especially for the Ness family as they said goodbye to Avis yesterday. And we pray also for Mayland Hur's family as we celebrated his life. God, we ask that you would surround this family, these families who are in the midst of sorrow and grief. Let us be instruments of your peace as we come around them to support them and encourage them in their time of grief. Oh God, we pray for those who are in positions of leadership in Washington, D.C. We have seen what has gone on in the last week come from both sides of the aisle. And we pray, oh God, that you will work in that place to bring justice and hope to our country. Let us come together to work together so that the underdogs in our communities may be served well and they may be emancipated from their pain and suffering. Oh God, we pray because we believe that you hear our prayers and we come with confidence as we pray as your children, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our God, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
where it talks about the thirsty coming to God and God satisfying them with good things. These topics can seem a little heavy sometimes, but we are also here to celebrate that God is in our midst bringing good things to people who are suffering, and that is a joy to be a part of that work. We forget sometimes, I think, as we come for worship on Sunday mornings that every single day people come into our building who are hurting and who are thirsty, and we give them something to drink, and we love them. As they come into our Dignity Center, they are welcomed with wide open arms, and they're given a cookie and a coffee, and someone sits down and listens carefully to their hearts, not telling them what to do or what they need, but just to listen to their story, to hear that thirst, to come alongside them, them. What a privilege it is for us to be a part of God's work to satisfy the hungry. Did you know that every single week, now look around, there's a few empty pews this morning, but do you know that every single week here at Hennepin, 600 people come for AA? 600 people come thirsty to do their steps, and they meet in our chapel, and in Koinonia Hall, and in our Sunday school classrooms. Every week, 600 folks come to be satisfied. Do you know that every single day, Monday through Friday, over 50 kids, and sometimes as many as 150 kids, are in our Sunday school wing through the Menick Charter School. And these are kids, 18 to 21, who have not finished high school because maybe they got into a gang. When I went to their graduation, I found out that many of these kids already have children of their own. And they come into our building every single week so they can earn a diploma, so they can have a better life and support their family and have hope in their world. And you're a part of that because you provide the space for that, a warm building that's well-maintained. A receptionist that sits at the desk and, and says, welcome to Hennepin, when every single person comes in our building. Welcome to Hennepin. We are so glad you're here. And we offer that radical hospitality that so many churches have forgotten how to do. Thank you for that. Thank you for giving so that that can happen and that can continue to happen. Now, we're in year 2023, and we still have not made our goal for our 22-23 budget, we have about $400,000 yet to raise so that we can give our staff some raises and so that we can continue to pay our utilities, which are over $150,000 a year just for our utilities. Now, that's not a sob story. That's an opportunity that we could be a part of what God is doing here to bring and satisfy hungry and thirsty folks. Those children that were down here with Keisha, they are hungry and thirsty to know about Jesus. So important that we're here for them so that they can know that God is indeed good. And God loves them. And God loves you too. So let's be a part of lifting up our blessings because we have all been blessed in different ways, some monetarily and financially and some in other ways. And, and, and we are called to do just what we can do. We can't solve all the problems in the world, but we can do what we can do. And so I ask that you would give generously so that the cup of salvation will overflow into people's lives and they will no longer be thirsty. Our ushers will move among us to receive our morning tithes, our gifts and our offerings. As we come alongside the underdogs in this community, as we serve them with joy and gladness.
sit down because there's a few announcements that I want to make today and they might take just a little bit longer than your knees can manage. We have five practices that we are about here at Hennepin. One of them is uh, radical hospitality, which we just talked about, but I want to extend radical hospitality to anyone who would like to join Hennepin. Today is the day for entry point, and you can come and meet with me after church in the Longfellow Room just off the Carlson Hall if you're interested in hearing more about what it means to be a member of Hennepin. It'll be at 1130. Bring your donut and your coffee in, and I've got some packets and information, and we'll chat and get to know each other better today at entry point following worship today. Also, one of you, it's so important for us to get together and talk to each other and break bread and eat together. So all of you and all of your friends and anybody you want to bring is invited to a potluck. It has been years since we had a potluck at Hennepin. I can't even remember how long it was ago, but we're going to have a potluck. It's going to be a soup potluck, and it will be on January 22nd in Koine Hall downstairs after worship. Bring your soup. We'll have lots of extension cords so you can plug in your crock pots. If you need some recipes, I think there are some Hennepin Happenings is going to publish some recipes from our cookbook, our church cookbooks from the archives. How cool is that? All right, so watch for that. And then we also have the, um, the practice of passionate worship. And we're called to worship passionately, and we care about what you think about worship. And we want to learn, and we want to improve our worship always. And we want to offer new things for worship. So if you care about passionate worship today, downstairs in Koinonia Hall, we're going to have a worship currents conversation. Mark Squire will be here to lead that with the worship and fine arts team. And they're going to be talking about that worship survey that you all filled out. And we're going to get the results back today, and you're going to hear what other people said about worship. And, and I want, we still want to hear you as you process that, and we share reflections on what worship can be here at Hennepin. So that's today. There's a lot going on today, so that's why I wanted you to sit. Um, we also are important about faith, intentional faith development. That's a part of being a Christian and walking in our disciple is to continue to grow in our faith. And we want our confirmation program to be intergenerational. So uh, Rogers has got a really wonderful group called the Reflections. They meet every week up in the Harrison Room. And he's invited the confirmation class to join that group today so that they can have some pretty radical discussion. It should be fun. So if you want to be a part of that, go upstairs to the art gallery and go into the Harrison Room. And Rogers, wave your hand. There you are. Roger's going to lead that group, and he's really good at leading groups, and you're going to have a great time. So that's today after worship up in the Harrison room. Whew. Is that enough? I got one more. I have been doing a lot of prayer and for reflection, and I think it's time for me to retire. And so I will be retiring this spring on June 11th, and that will be my last Sunday at Hennepin. I have been here almost eight years, by, it will be eight years by that time, and I have grown to love you deeply. And um, these next months will be a long goodbye, but we'll try to have a lot of fun too. I want you to know that I have so much confidence in our Staff Parish Relations Committee. Jeff Niblack is the chair of that. And Jeff, would you stand? There's Jeff. He's a wonderful leader, and I will be sending out a letter today, or tomorrow. It will be coming in your mailbox, and there is a listing of all the SPR leaders. They are working with our district superintendent, Cynthia Williams, and our new bishop, Lynette Plambeck. You heard her preach last Sunday. If you missed that, you can go online and listen to her preach. They have been working on the process. In the United Methodist Church, we have an appointive system. And so uh, some of you might be thinking, oh, it's going to take a long time to find a new lead pastor. The conference, the Minnesota Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, will help us in this process, and they will search for a new lead pastor, and they will make an appointment by June so that you have a brand new lead pastor and you will have no gap where there is no pastor. So if you've been Lutheran and you're thinking, oh, no, a whole year of call, no. You will have a new lead pastor. We have um, turned in our updated profile so that the cabinets, have the district superintendents and the bishop can know a little bit more about us and can have a sense of who we are. The staff parish has met with our district superintendent and they have given input. And we want you to be part of the process. 
So when you get your letter in the mailbox, there will also be a survey there. And I'm asking you to fill it out about what your hopes and dreams are for Advent, or for, for Penipin, uh, what your hopes and dreams are for the church, what you think you need in a new lead pastor. Um, fill that out and bring that back by January 31st. You can also fill it out online. You'll be getting this information um, electronically. Or there'll be a special email that will also go out tomorrow. And you can click on the link and fill out that survey in that way too. We really do value what you think. We want to know. And so you can be a part of this process. Again, I want to thank you for all many years. We have lots of ministry to do until June together, and I look forward to all of those days and months as we continue to build a bridge for the next lead pastor. Let us rise now and let us join our hearts and voices together as we sing our closing hymn. May the broad expanse of God's love and the abundance of God's justice shape your perspective on the needs of your community. May the Holy Spirit give you the courage to take action in pursuit of justice, love, and joy, and compassion. May the thoughts of Jesus fill your mind, and may the hunger for God fill your soul. And may you have a love for God's people, and, as you, and may it guide you as you treat and build and form the beloved community. Amen.